If you were to look at the dates of both my Al Ahram article, which was called Native Informer and the Making of American Empire, and then subsequently uh, the date of the publication of my book, Brown Skin and White Masks, they coincide with the preparatory stages of the US led invasion of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And my concern was, as you know, I live in New York, I live in the United States, so I see the manner in which the propaganda machinery of American imperialism gets ready for war with Afghanistan, with, uh, uh, with uh, Iraq, etc. That machinery is very well oiled, particularly in the context of successive Israeli uh, wars, whether uh, against the occupied Palestinians in occupied territories, or in Lebanon, or in Syria, or in Egypt, etc. So I'm very well attuned to the manner in which American media prepares Americans either to justify the Israeli occupation of Palestine, or when U.S. starts engaging for war. If you have Americans in, in newspaper, in media, in television, radio, etc., arguing that Americans should go and invade Afghanistan, you understand, these are American, this is what they wanted. It became particularly troubling for me when I saw Arabs, Iranians, uh, Turks, etc., they begin to justify. That became very bizarre to me. It has a theoretical basis. Edward Said had published a book called Representation of Intellectuals, in which he argues, and rightly so, that intellectuals should never be at home where they live. They should also always be not physical e exile, but mentally, intellectually in exile. Now, this worked well for Edward Said, right? He became a very prominent Palestinian intellectual, the most eloquent defender of Palestinian cause while he lived in uh, New York and taught in my university, Columbia. But then I saw there are people like Azar Nafisi, like Fuad al -Ajami, like Basama Tibbi, these people, these are also, they don't live in, uh, in their homeland, they also live uh, abroad. But their voice and their arguments and their uh, writings not only is not critical of United States, but is actually in line with United States. Give you an example. Example of veiling. Some Muslim women veil. Some Muslim women don't veil. Some Arab women veil. Some Arab women don't veil. It's a domestic issue. You see in one uh, family, mothers perhaps veil and daughters don't veil. It's not a big issue. I mean, they decide and don't decide. Societies change, countries change, cultures change. But when you turned the question of veiling into repression of women, Muslim women are veiled, which is not true, not all Muslim women veil, and veiling is an indication of repression and social backwardness and political this, then suddenly, if the U.S. invades Afghanistan, or if U.S. invades uh, Iraq, U.S. is in a position of liberating Muslim women. Number one, Muslim women don't have any agency of their own. Number two, uh, nobody else cares, their, their brothers, their fathers, their uh, husbands, they don't care about their well-being. And they wait, you're waiting for American soldiers to go and liberate them. This is the social and political condition of my writing uh, uh, those, the, the first the article and then the book. Is the, uh, the uh, argument still valid? Uh, in light of the rise of Arab revolutions, the Arab Spring, what was peculiar is for you, for example, to look at Tahrir Square. You see half of the population are women. You look at Yemen, Tawakkul Karman, the leader of the, uh, of the uh, Arab Revolution, Yemeni Revolution, was a woman. She got the Nobel Prize. And she, she, has, uh, she was a muhaggabe, right? So they, the world saw that women are agents. They are out in the streets. They are in the squares. They are leading revolutions, whether it's Tunisia, it's Egypt, it's Yemen. 
And then suddenly they realize, they look back at Palestine and see Palestinians have been resisting the occupation of their homeland with women at the forefront of uh, their, uh, their uprising. Suddenly they began to realize, who was uh, Leila Ahmad? Wasn't she a woman? Wasn't she a revolutionary? Wasn't she, didn't she have agency to assert herself, her national uh, aspirations for statehood, etc.? So Arab revolutions, uh, uh, Arab Spring became a catalyst suddenly to see women who were in the streets of Paris or the streets of London or the streets of New York were considered to be weird, strange, repressed, backward. They were actually leading a revolution in Tunis and so forth. So that became a important turning point to uh, realize that uh, uh, whether it's the question of women or the question of uh, agency in general, not just women, men, women, old, young, uh, Arabs, Muslims, Iranians, Turks, they are in a position to represent themselves and assert themselves and they do their, in their own languages. They do it in Arabic, they do it in Persian, they do it in Turkish. When Gezi Park uprising, for example, happened in, in Turkey, when the Green Movement began in Iran, when the Jasmine Revolution began in uh, Tunisia, uh, the fact that these revolutions were homegrown, the fact that they were towards social justice, political freedom, economic justice, women's rights, minorities' rights, and none of them were instigated by Europe, or they were Europeanized, or they were Westernized. They were decidedly in their local languages. When people in Egypt said, Ashab, Yurid, Asqat, and Azam, they were not saying it in English or French. They were saying it in their own language. So that became a very important turning point, rubbing these native informers, comprador intellectuals, I call them gun for hires, of uh, going on television and so forth to represent Arabs, Iranians, Turks, that simply by virtue of their name being Azar or Fa'ad al-Ajami or thing of that sort, or speaking English with a, or with a Persian or Arabic or a Turkish accent, that they know what they are talking about. So up until the Arab revolutions, this diagnosis was critical for us to talk about no, of course there are issues in all of these societies, but these people are not representative. These people's ideas, arguments, and articulations actually at the service of American imperialism and intervention and acculturation and so forth. After the revolution, of course these figures still existed, but now people like me, we were not the only voices to say, okay, that's your opinion, and that's Kanan Makiya's. Uh, uh, Kanan Makiya said, go for it, invade Iraq. The Iraqis will welcome you with baklava and rose water. And I will say, no, don't go, uh, it's none of your business. Now, with the Arab Revolution, it was not between me and Kanan Makiya, or between me, me and uh, Father Ajami. The Arabs, Iranians were out in the streets articulating their own position. So it was a very important development. In my book on uh, uh, Arab revolutions, and in my book on uh, uh, the uh, post-Orientalism, my argument was to take the insight of Edward Said, but to historicize it, not to, to defetishize it. Because Edward Said had discovered extraordinary insight the relationship between knowledge and power, which he took from Foucault. I mean, there are sociologists like Max Scheler and Karl Mannheim, uh, sociologists of knowledge, who had articulated it before Foucault, but Foucault became the most important person that Said knew. It's very important to know Said was neither a sociologist nor a historian. He was a literary critic, and uh, Foucault became very fashionable by the time that uh, uh, Edward Said was writing Orientalism. So he takes it from Foucault, but concentrates on a particular mode of knowledge production, which we know as Orientalism, and it coincides, it, it is coterminous, with the period of 
uh, European imperialism. Imperialism is in need of knowledge. When Napoleon goes, for example, to Egypt, when the British go to India, when the French go to Algeria, it is not just military conquest. They need intellectual conquest. They need moral imaginative con conquest. Uh, Macaulay, who was a, a colonial officer, British colonial officer, in, a, in famous minutes to, on education, he said, we need a generation of Indians who look Indian on the outside, but they think uh, British. Orientalism, as a result, was a mode of knowledge production that was at the service and at the same time as Orientalism, as uh, imperialism. But imperialism is a historical organicity. It doesn't stay stable. It was of a period of time that you have imperial powers based in London or Paris uh, or uh, Brussels. They go to Africa, they go to Asia, they go to Latin America, and they produce knowledge about these places in a manner that is conducive to their uh, uh, imperial interest. My point was that this does not remain stable. And the formation of uh, Soviet Union and the uh, Eastern European and uh, Middle Eastern and Far Eastern countries around Soviet Union, which was commensurate with the rise of uh, Cold War, this created a new condition. And this condition of uh, Cold War was no longer classical condition of imperialism. And as a result, classical Orientalism uh, gradually yielded to a mode of knowledge production that was conducive to area studies. Area studies, if you look at uh, departments of area studies, Eastern European studies, Middle Eastern studies, Far Eastern studies, they were all areas around Soviet Union, and they were supposed to produce knowledge for American and European policy uh, institutions that helped uh, control Soviet Union and prevent the spread of uh, socialism and socialist ideas and, and so forth. This shift in history was predicated on my dynamic understanding of imperialism. Imperialism is not a stable. Imperialism is, a, I always say, imperialism is abuse of labor by capital times geography. That's all is imperialism. Imperialism happens everywhere. Right here in Doha, there is imperialism. In New York, there is imperialism. In India, there is imperialism. Labor migration is the result of imperialism. Capital not recognizing uh, borders and barriers is, uh, is uh, imperialism, uh, etc. If this is the case, then even the condition we call Cold War is not stable. Because after the collapse of Soviet Union, the collapse of Eastern Europe, the falling of the Berlin Wall, now we no longer have a Soviet Union for you to have an area around it, for you to produce knowledge to contain Soviet Union. This is the phase that I called it the production of uh, knowledge that was disposable knowledge. Uh, because the, at the period of Orientalism, classical Orientalism, you had British Empire, you had French Empire, you had Belgian Empire. But now, uh, in the period of post-Cold War, we entered a condition that Hardin Negri called in empire as a condition of power, not as a direct imperial uh, control, which means now we have World Bank and IMF and the United Nations as intermediary institutions that sustain the relation of power between the beneficiaries of capitalism and those that are, that are uh, disenfranchised by it. This necessitates what I call in my book on uh, uh, post-Orientalism uh, disposable, uh, dis disposable knowledge. What is disposable knowledge? U.S. wants to invade Afghanistan and hires anthropologists, linguists, political scientists to just tell them where is Afghanistan and how to control it. That phase is not classical Orientalism anymore because nobody holds 
uh, Fuad al-Ajami, responsible. Didn't you say that if we go uh, invade Iraq, they will be happy and send us baklava and rose water? He said, do it, they will be happy, but then they go, they were not happy, the whole hell broke loose. He doesn't say, I, nobody holds him responsible. He, cannot, he doesn't say, I apologize, I'm sorry, no. John Bolton is still, who is now the National Security Advisor to this crazy White House, he still says, no, that was a great, great, because nobody holds anybody responsible. So, the moral of the story was for us to understand the enduring insight of Foucault slash Edward Said, of the relationship between knowledge and power, but not get stuck up in one particular mode of knowledge production called Orientalism, but keep going to see how imperialism evolves and as a, how capital is evolving, how imperialism is evolving, and as a result, how modus operandi of knowledge production to sustain this relation of power is also uh, changing. Right now, if you look at the last presidential election 2016 and the manner in which uh, the Russians or whoever, Eastern Europeans or some entity, uh, Cambridge Analytica, they manipulated data, manipulated social uh, uh, networking data in order to persuade certain segment, uh, a statistically significant segment of the society to believe in certain fictitious uh, nonsense in order to affect their uh, voting pattern, that's a different stage of knowledge production. So we have to stay with the way in which capital evolves, imp imperialism evolves, and knowledge production evolves. The period we called post-truth, alternative facts, these are the period of uh, the most recent stages of knowledge production to try to sustain the relation of power. Absolutely. What I wrote at the, at the height and, and uh, zenith of Arab revolutions, I still believe in it. Not that I'm fanatical about what I wrote, but that I am consistent in what I, what, the way I read uh, Arab revolutions. First of all, what I meant and what I mean by the end of post-colonialism is a particular historical moment of knowledge production and resistance production, and ideology production. I don't believe, as I said earlier, that there is one uh, uh, basic and unchangeable condition of power and domination. Power and domination changes, resistance changes. And I don't think the Arab revolutions were defeated. I think Arab revolutions exposed the vacuous, illegitimate disposition of post-colonial state. States such as uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria, such as Sisi in Egypt, uh, such as uh, the Saudi family or every, every other ruling family in every uh, other uh, Arab state, recent or uh, back to the 19th century. These states were the myth of post-colonial state formations. The total fabrication of the notion of nation-state, nations related to a state, is a colonial fabrication. It has nothing to do with, uh, with us. We were, we, we meaning Arabs, Iranians, Turks, uh, uh, Africans, uh, Asians, we were part of three last Muslim empires. The Ottomans, the uh, Safavid slash Qajars, and the uh, Mughals in India. These three Muslim empires collapsed under the onslaught of European uh, imperialism, French and the British in particular. From this crash emerged eventual nation states. Here is Syria, here is Turkey, here is Iran, here is Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Syria, etc. What has happened in the course of the Arab revolutions, in my opinion, we have the decoupling of the nation and the state. The nation has gone its way, and the state has gone its way. The best example of it is, is, in fact, Palestinians. Palestinians are a nation without a state. Israel is a state without a nation. 
That is the epitome of what has happened. Now, Palestinians today, look at them. They still are more convinced that they are a people than ever. They produce literature, culture. They have their uh, hopes, aspirations, histories, everything. They continue to know themselves as Palestinians, excavate as Palestinians, write history as Palestinians, articulate their arts, cinema, culture, poetry as Palestinians. They don't have a state. Can Mahmoud Abbas say I'm a Palestinian state? It's, it's a joke. On the other hand, Israelis with masses of billions of dollars of Zionism on it, they cannot. There are millions of Jews who refuse. It has nothing to do with us. Not every Jew is a Zionist. Not every Zionist is a Jew. There are many Muslim Zionists, as you well know. There are many Christian Zionists. There are many Hindu Zionists. There are many Buddhist Zionists. And there are some Jewish Zionists. So the equation of Zionism and Judaism is a flawed nonsense. Is a colonial settler colony, is a colonialism with a settler colonial apparatus, and a garrison state that tries to rule uh, uh, millions of Palestinians and cannot rule. Uh, uh, right now, uh, demographically, Palestinians have actually outnumbered, not the wood, uh, uh, the Zionists. Now. The issue is that we have a similar situation in every Arab country. Look at Egypt. Right now they had a ridiculous uh, election. CC, go, oh, vote. And now uh, tomorrow they will say 99.99% .99 voted for CC. Where is my pillow? There are almost 100 million Egyptians. Huh? They, they, that state apparatus of repression and cruelty doesn't have control over it. Many of my colleagues, even Egyptian intellectuals, they tell me Egypt is not the intellectual center of the Arab world as it used to be. How do we measure? We measure it by poetry, by novel, by uh, film, by uh, theater, uh, etc. But the other part of, uh, of that is that the mode of expression of culture has changed. The internet, the, the blogs, the uh, social networking, the uh, underground music, the mode of expression has changed. 100 million human beings in, in one country recognizing themselves as, as Egyptians cannot be controlled. You look at Syria, I mean, look at the brutality of Bashar al-Assad. Look at millions of Syrians being slaughtered, millions of uh, Syrians being forced out of uh, their homeland. But if you put the Syrians who are now in places like Camp Zaatari inside Syria, or in Lebanon, or in Turkey, or even in uh, going to Europe. Still, they are more conscious of being Syrians. How, what does it mean? In what way? The trauma of uh, Syrian revolution, not S Syrian civil war. This nonsense of Syrian civil war has, is, is gibberish, means nothing. Is Syrian revolution that was uh, repressed first by uh, Bashar al-Assad and then Americans, Israelis, Iranians, and etc. began to uh, intervene. The point of the argument is that yes, I remain as optimistic about the future of these revolutions as I was when I wrote that book, but the dynamics of how we understand society, state, nation, manifestations of a national uh, identity, they change. Arab societies, 320 million uh, human beings, uh, Arabs, is a multinational state. Okay, Many of them now, the, the, there's a considerable number of Egyptians right here in Doha. Palestinians, Syrians. There is nothing particular about Doha. They may go to Cairo, they may go to uh, uh, Oman, they may go to Kuwait, they may go anywhere. Okay, the, the fact is that no particular state apparatus defeated, illegitimate, subject to manipulation by Israel and the uh, US, etc., they do not represent. They are not, they don't have any claim over 320 million Arabs. So I'm not, I remain optimistic about the Arab revolutions and I do not consider Arab revolutions a defeat. Let that be a lesson to your generation. I'm 66, 67, the 25, 26, tell me the Arab revolution is defeated.
Again, excellent question, but ill-informed because I have written extensively on Islamic liberation theology in two books, both in my Theology of Discontent and also in my Islamic liberation theology resisting the empire. That's number one. Number two, uh, the assertion that Islamism, not Islamic revolutionary ideas, these are two different things. Islamism is absolutely correct, is as much a result of colonialism as is fair world socialism, liber new liberalism, and uh, uh, mon monarchic nationalism. Yes, they're all product of encounter with, uh, with colonialism. Now, the point is that uh, the single most important aspect of Islamic liberation theology is that it is in dialogue with anti-colonial nationalism and with third world socialism. Anywhere that you look, with the, and by that I mean there are three major countries that you have to look at them, Egypt, Turkey, and Iran. These three countries are quintessential to the history of our region. Why? Longevity of history, density of population. Egypt is almost 100 million people. Iran is almost 80 million. Yeah, Turkey is less, but has a long history and is conscious of that history. When you look at these three countries, what happens? Yes, you have Islamists. Yes, you have socialists. Yes, you have nationalists. But they are in conversation with each other. They inform each other. They act as each other's catalysts. If you look at the catastrophe of Islamic Republic in Iran, the most glorious period of Islamic ideas was back in the 50s, 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. Why? Because is Islamic thinkers like Mutahari, like Talagani, like Shariati, they were in dialogue either inside Iran or outside Iran, with Marxism, with third world socialism, with anti-colonial nationalism. So even if they did not identify themselves as anti-colonial nationalists or third world socialists, socialism and anti-colonial nationalism had penetrated their, their critical thinking. Shariati was a socialist, Talagani was a socialist. Where did they get their socialism? Except in dialogue with socialist forces. So, I, in my uh, canon Europeans think, which is a rhetorical uh, thing, the, the first chapter of it, can Europeans read, is the inability to read. Muslims, of course, create ideas, secular, those who think they're secular, feminists, uh, nationalists, they, they all produce ideas. But these ideas f are more in dialogue with each other. It is this tacit horizontal dialogue which I wanted to bring forth, rather than this vertical uh, conversation with the European as a dominant uh, thing. In the case of uh, Arab societies, this dialectic between Arab and Qarb, Qarb, Arab, Arab, Qarb, this is, needs to break down. And it is absolutely imperative for particularly next generation of Arab intellectuals to open up this space Yes, Arab countries from Morocco to Syria to Palestine is very important. But the neighborhood of India, of Africa, of Iran, of Turkey is very important in terms of understanding the dialectic of knowledge production. That is always dialogical, is not monological. I have no way of explaining. To me, Zizek was never brave. Zizek was always a bourgeois uh, intellectual and philosopher. And uh, I completely agree with Zizek that Syrians have no conception of European values because European values are plundering, dominating, raping, destroying uh, the world, the environment, Asia, Africa, Latin America. Great that Syrians have no understanding of this 
preposterous European values. You see, the, the problem is that bourgeois European uh, philosophers like uh, Zizek, uh, they have this delusional conception of the Enlightenment and, uh, and uh, modernity, uh, etc. They, they have no understanding that, as my dear friend and distinguished uh, uh, Argentinian philosopher, Walter Mignolo said that there is a dark side to this enlightenment. And another great Argentinian philosopher, dear friend of mine, uh, Enrique Dussel in uh, liberation uh, philosophy or liberation ethics, or Gustavo Gutierrez in liberation theology, they, all of them have argued the manner in which this self-universalizing, self-congratulating, patting themselves on the, on the back, every this is Benjamin, this is not me. Benjamin said every monument to civilization is a monument of barbarity. They should even read at least their own philosophers and critical thinkers. That uh, all of this art, beautiful art, beautiful architecture, beautiful poetry, beautiful novels, beautiful philosophy, it is actually the, the reality that Heidegger, the greatest philosopher of 20th century, was a freaking Nazi, is the quintessence of European philosophy. The dark side of it is Nazism and concentration camps and Holocaust, and the bright side of it is Zeit und Zeit. It's a beautiful, magnificent philosophical text. Now, our generation of critical thinkers, I am neither uh, Eurocentric nor Europhobic, do you follow? Because they don't, they adore Europhobia. Because they, if you are afraid of Euro, uh, Europe, then there, there is something about Europe. No, Europe is just one country, another, like any other uh, continent, like any other continent. It has dark sides and it has light sides. And uh, what Zizek calls European values, okay, these European values, he has to look around the world. Where are these European values? Let's go begin with Bartolomeo de las Casas. Uh, a short account of the destruction of Indies, okay, it's middle of the 16th century. Bartolomeo de las Casas was a, San, a Franciscan friar who eyewitnessed the manner in which the conquistadors, the, uh, uh, the generation of Christopher Columbus, slaughtered Native Americans. And they slaughtered them on Christian terminology. They will, for example, hang 12 in the in the uh, for the glory of the twelve apostles in uh, in uh, thing. so they need to rethink and re relearn from the perspective of Africa Asia Latin America what precisely are these European values he was never courageous he was never even a serious critical thinker uh, he's you know he's a fat and European th uh, high school and college students like him because he's entertaining. What I mean by, and let me give you the history of how I came up with this notion of uh, uh, traumatic realism. I put together a Palestinian film festival back in 2003 in New York. It began out of my concern by teaching Arab cinema, Iranian cinema, Turkish cinema, African cinema, and there was no available resources for us to teach about Palestinian cinema. I remember I went to Edward, and Edward put me in touch with Michel Khalaifi, for example. And this is when still we had this old-fashioned uh, videos, uh, uh, bootlegged, and, and so forth. I didn't, to make a long story short, I spent two decades collecting whatever I could of Palestinian cinema in multiple formats and so forth. Then when we put the Palestinian Film Festival together, Anne-Marie Josser and I, uh, she, I organized it, she curated it, and Emily Josser was in Jerusalem and was helping us and so forth. Uh, then I put a, f a, a website together and began to edit a book on Palestinians. I remember some Palestinian friends, Ed Edward himself, so what do you want to talk about Palestinians? There is no Palestinians in 
When I took our festival to Palestine, we took it to six Palestinian cities, to Jerusalem, to uh, Ramallah, to Bethlehem, Bet Sahur, Nablus, and Nazareth. They wouldn't let me go to Gaza, the Israelis. I remember when we were in Jerusalem, there was no movie theater to show uh, uh, any film. We, rent, we went to YMCA in Jerusalem, East Jerusalem. YMCA, just the, the hall, with these foldable chairs and makeshift uh, curtain to show, uh, you know, Taskar al Quds of Rashid Masharabi, something like that. That cut a couple of years after that, Elia, Elia Suleiman, had just uh, finished his film Yadun Elahiya, Divine Intervention, and they wanted to submit it to the Academy Award for the category of Best Film. Academy Awards says we can't accept it, because to accept a film by a country, that film first will have to be shown in the country of origin. We have a, a poem by Rumi, it says, this man had a uh, donkey, but didn't have a saddle. Went and found the saddle, meantime, the wolf had eaten the donkey. <laughs> so, it's, a, it's a vicious circle, how can you, how can you, the, the country has been stolen. There is no movie theater to show the thing. We're showing it in Sakakini and, and uh, uh, other institutions. This generated the idea, okay, if there are no, there is no cinema industry, if there is no infrastructure for Palestinian cinema, how can we talk about Palestinian cinema? This is when I came with the idea of uh, trauma at the center of a national cinema. And I began to theorize it all the way back to Russian cinema, to uh, I said, the rise of Russian cinema, Russian formalism, is aftermath of Russian Revolution. The rise of Italian new realism is aftermath of uh, Mussolini. Ra the, the rise of French uh, new wave in the aftermath of the French filmmakers coming to terms with colonialism. German new cinema was also in the aftermath of Holocaust. Cuban cinema, Iranian cinema, Chinese cinema. When we go around the globe, you see that there is a tra trauma, a national trauma that has manifested itself in the form of sometimes poetry, sometimes literature, and in my case, for my interest, was cinema. This is how I came with the notion of traumatic cinema, uh, or traumatic realism. By that I meant that a trauma is like a nightmare. Then you wake up from, from a nightmare. And you want to tell your uh, friend, your family, what you dreamt of. And that trauma remains constant, but your narrative keeps changing. Tomorrow you may say it differently, or if you are in another context and another country, you may say it differently. But the, but the origin of it is that trauma. That origin, in the case of Palestinian cinema, is Nakba. But Nakba is inexplicable, is so atrocious, it is so uh, abusive, it is so unjust. There is no explanation. How can you say, if I, if I put my hand in your pocket and took your, uh, your wallet, you get angry. But stealing somebody's land from under their feet, it's just that there is, there is a crime that there is no scream loud enough. This is what I call trauma. So it doesn't really have to do with what they're presenting within the movie. Exactly. That, that, that trauma had various manifestations. Mahmoud Darwish's poetry, Ghassan Kanafani's uh, uh, fiction, uh, eventually becomes a Palestinian cinema. So what holds Palestinian cinema together, what constitutes a Palestinian cinema, is not a Palestinian film industry, but this trauma to which everybody points but until Elia Soleiman's Fizaman al Bari, no Palestinian had actually made a film about Nakba. That's very important. The first film about Palestinian Nakba was made by an Egyptian filmmaker, Yusri Nasrallah, based on a Lebanese 
ناول دار شمس باب شمس با الیاس خوری نو قصان کنفانیز ریترن تو هایفا ایز الودز تو نکبه بات نکبه ایز سو تراماتیک دات it is not easy for a palette and the first film about Nakba which I've told earlier is the last film because it is impossible to make a film about Nakba is by a man who doesn't talk cannot talk ES in Elias Sermons Fizaman al Baqi. the traumatic realism at the heart of Palestinian cinema is still very much varied, uh, present, but manifestations of it is different. For example, if you were to look at wonderful three, four films that Anne-Marie Josser has uh, made, particularly his Lama Shuftu, the, uh, When I Saw You, or the first feature film that Mai Masri made. Mai Masri is a documentary filmmaker, but the first feature film that she made about women in Israeli, Palestinian women in Israeli uh, prisons uh, is an indication that that trauma remains definitive to this cinema. However, by virtue of the changes in technology, the introduction of digital camera and other uh, uh, changes in the, in the instrumentality of, of cinema has had an effect on this traumatic uh, realism. Apropos uh, Hani Abba Asad, Hani Abba Asad has had a long, in many ways, uh, illustrious uh, career, but his latest move to Hollywood and the mountain in between us, I really don't know what to think. He's no longer a Palestinian uh, filmmaker. He's a, he has mastered his craft, he's a good uh, uh, director, he has a good sense of cinema, but for me, his absolute masterpiece, nobody probably has seen it, is a, a film called Fort Transit. Is about the cab driver between Jerusalem and Ramallah. It is absolute masterpiece. Now, other films, Jannatul An, I love. Uh, it has amazing things. Uh, Omar, I love because I wrote about Omar as a love story. How could Palestinians fall in love? How do you tell a love story in in this context? And and uh, others, but to me. Especially after his turn to Hollywood, I'm, I hope he comes back uh, to Palestinian cinema. Uh, until then, to me, the new discovery for me, the most glorious, is Kamal Jafari. Kamal Jafari is something else. His cinema, his camera work is scary, what the way he does with memory, and what he did his movie Recollection in Haifa. Uh, he, Kamal, represents a new generation of Palestinian filmmaker. Mohanad Yaqubi is another, uh, another one of them. That uh, we are, I would say, uh, uh, Anne-Marie Jasser, uh, Kamal Jafari, Mohanad Yaqubi, and Sameh, Sameh Zobi, my own student. They, these are, this, this is a new generation of filmmakers who are onto something different that is more corresponding with the realities of sort of post-Oslo delusion. There was an Oslo delusion, and this is post-Oslo delusion that uh, needs to be mapped out. I mean, now I'm just watching them. Among all of them, I would say, I mean, I have, they're all friends, I love and admire all of them, but there is something about Kamala Jafari's cinema that opens up cinematically, aesthetically, politically into a new world and horizon that needs to be articulated for, before we understand it. And how do you read something like uh, Five Broken Camera? <laughs> Five Broken Camera, which I adore, is a wonderful film, is circumstantial cinema. I mean, it had to do with the particularities of this Palestinian who was trying to document his own uh, uh, history. And uh, uh, there is a film by uh, Muhammad Bakri, the Palestinian actor. He did a film called Janin Janin. Uh, it's about the Janin uh, massacre that 
if you see it, the first shot, the camera is behind the back of uh, Muhammad Bakri. Muhammad Bakri was Clint Eastwood of Palestinian cinema, very tall, handsome, arrogant. Uh, Michel Khalafi miscast him in the movies in Deer, but that's a different story. Uh, but he never looks at camera. That's a remarkable development. The camera is here. We see the back of uh, Muhammad's head. And for the first time, we see the presence of Handala, the figure of Handala, who we never see his face because he's angry with us. His back is to us. He's looking as a shahid. He's looking at the event. I remember right here in Doha, there was an exhibition of uh, uh, Iraqi artist uh, Diyar al Azawi, and I went to see Diyar al Azawi's uh, exhibition, and he had a huge statue of uh, uh, Handala. But you could see Handala's face. When I saw it, I didn't want to, because we we're not allowed to look at Handala. You see the manifestation of Handala in Janine Janine film. Uh, in that. And in many ways, then after that, I began to look at E.S. character, Ilya Suleiman's character, as also a gestation of Handala. And in Palestinian cinema in general, as a sort of visualization of uh, uh, Najil Ali's uh, character of uh, Handala. Uh, so we need to sort of be patient to see in one particular way this generation of Palestinians and also cinema is not the only mode, uh, uh, mode of expression of anxiety, anger, hope, uh, aspirations and, and so forth. Uh, right now, if you look at going back to your question about the five broken cameras, uh, these broken cameras, if you put them together, each one camera is broken, but when you put them together, there is a sculpted view of the truth and reality of Palestinian uh, cause that going back to your original question about uh, armed resistance, one should neither uh, denounce arms uh, resistance nor fetishize it. One should look at the totality of Palestinians. To me, Palestinians have resisted not by their intellectuals and poets, but by living, by love, by life, by birth, by uh, naming their children uh, Palestinian names and families and cooking and this is Maalouba and this is Musakh. You know that is that's Palestine. That cannot be denied or concealed, or repressed. Speaking of musakhan, I just got tired and hungry. I wish I had a little bit of musakhan right now. <laughs>